I want to introduce probably the squarest looking kid I have ever met, and his personality matches the way he looks. <laughs> Jimmy Sennenberger, welcome. John? That was an insult, by the way. Oh, uh, you know what? I accept it. You accept and I, it. I embrace it. All right, you, you have this look like you have been constantly 12, and I've known you for, it seems like 20 years, but, but you've kept this look. Hey, as my parents say, it's going to pay off someday. So I'm looking forward to that day. For now, I'll just look young. Just look, enjoy it. I, I wanted to bring you on to talk about think tanks and one that has been created for millennials. First of all, people don't quite get what think tanks are. We put out all these different policy ideas. Some get involved in different areas. And you've got liberal ones. You've got conservative ones. You've got libertarian ones like Cato and Reason and Independence Institute. What is yours? It's called the Millennial Policy Center, and what we are is what I like to think of as a new kind of think tank for a new generation. So we're very much about developing and researching ideas on policy issues that are facing our nation. So we're primarily national, do a little bit of local and state stuff, but primarily national. And our goal is not just to be putting out research and information, but to really be a persuasive force, particularly among the millennial generation, those who are now about 19 to 36, and also to be a voice on behalf of the millennial you, you generation. You understand the problem you've, you've created here. You've named this thing the Millennial Institute, Millennial uh, Policy Center. And as you grow older, you're going to have to get canned or change the name. You should never limit yourself to something like this. That's why I work for the Independence Institute. Mm -hmm. I, I, can, I can ride this scam for the rest of my life. Yeah, I think it's a very valid point, and we actually did go through some considerations in developing this name and title. Uh, the reason for focusing on the millennial generation is because it's such an important one at this point in time. And I think being a, a voice that's very clearly delineated as representing millennials and those who are more on the center-right side of the spectrum is very important because we don't have that kind of representation. And the millennial generation will get older, but we will always exist. All right, let's talk about some of the stereotypes because there's a lot of truth in these stereotypes. Millennials are some of the most annoying young people we've, we've ever seen because they seem so very self-involved. And they wear man buns. And that for themselves deserves as some sort of corporal punishment. Uh, and they seem, they seem like as if you don't give them enough feedback and constant uh, compliments that they, they just stop. The, the joke being, they don't know how to work. They don't know how to hold down a job. They are taken care of by their parents. And they can't take care of themselves because they're just on their phones all day. Fair? Unfair? I don't think so. I think for a couple of reasons. For example, one of the things that's very important to keep in mind there are a lot of millennials who are still living at home, unfortunately. But one of the important things here is that in 2008, the financial crisis hit. And a great many millennials had just graduated college or were getting into college. And we've had a very raw deal as a result of the recession and the financial collapse. In addition, now you sound like a millennial. That, that was a key uh, word, victim. That's what millennials oh, are. Oh, I'm not they're, saying they're anything victims. of a victim. All I'm saying is that there are certain circumstances that have made it difficult in terms of the financial arrangements. For example, student loans. It's one of the issues that we've tackled at the Millennial Policy Center. The cost of higher education has skyrocketed 500% or so since 1980. Uh, it's outpaced all other different forms of commodities. You've got more student loan debt now than credit card debt. That is something that is putting a financial strain. It's one of the reasons why you see fewer millennials getting married these days. So there are circumstances, but that's not an excuse for not standing up and addressing these issues from a generational perspective, and that's why we exist. All right, as much as I love to rip on millennials, mostly because they're just young, and who likes young people? Nobody. Th there's also a very different mindset. I'm of the generation that has one foot still in the analog world, actually knows how to use a turntable and an eight-track tape player, and one foot in the digital world, and I'm stuck in between. And, and, but after us, your age, it's all digital. That our generation can't understand the potential that you see that millennials see in how to create businesses, how to dest creatively destroy something and, and go someplace else. The, I believe the millennial mind, when and if it ever works, works in a very different way. Am I, am I right? I think there is definitely some truth to that in the sense that when it comes to millennials, we very much are creative and try to use our ingenuity in the sense that the millennial generation has so many different technological opportunities to create, let's say, apps to be able to just 
decide, hey, I want to go drive an Uber or a Lyft and create my own schedule. That there are a lot of different opportunities with coding and other technologies to create things that you weren't able to create in the past. And millennials very much are, have this self-drive and self-motivation to create our own schedules and be able to determine things on our own terms, which is where you do see a lot of this creativity come out in terms of jobs and different businesses that are created. I, mean, I think Mark Zuckerberg is a, is a millennial and the very high end of the millennial generation but he's still uh, a millennial and look at the creative things that he's done with Facebook and so many different of the uh, Instagram and so forth that's so popular these days. And why are you all so annoying? All right, here's the other part. If you have a car and you need to have some sort of millennial anti-theft device, you just buy a stick shift because nobody knows how to. No, none this of you is know very how to drive true. That. This is very true. Can, can you drive a stick shift? I can't drive a stick. You can? I cannot. I admit it. And you're going to take care of this generation in old age. Somehow we're going to be able to do it. I'm not yeah. sure how, but one way or another, we will. Yeah, that's why we're all nervous. All right, so talk to me about the, the, the think tank part of this. This is different in that you've got, um, you've got something surrounded by young people, for young people, but you're doing it on a free market side. That's very different. My perception is, and tell me if it's right, most millennials, if you talk to them, they might not say they're Republicans, they're Democrats, but I would tend to think they all lean towards the pro-government side. Would I be wrong or right? No, I, I think that there is a tendency, probably a, somewhat of a majority, that does lean in that direction, more towards government solutions. And that's part of the reason why we exist, is to be able to be a voice to let them know there are alternatives, ways of thinking. You don't have to lock yourself into this stereotypical millennial mindset when it comes to the issues of the day. Instead, there is an approach that will work. I mean, one of the things we like to talk about is, as I mentioned before, Uber, Lyft, Facebook, uh, the smartphone, these things that have created so many opportunities are a result of free market capitalism, not the result of some kind of dictate from the government. So this is how you're going to be able to generate jobs and opportunity for so many people of all generations is because of the free market. And I think it's really a, a more clear-cut case to be made. And we focus, I should mention, largely on what we call PMMs, or politically marginal millennials. And so our focus isn't to convert somebody who's on the hard left or simply to preach to the choir of somebody who's on the right, but to reach those who are more towards the middle, who pay some attention but aren't necessarily solidified in an ideology yet. My hope is, and maybe I'm misreading this, that millennials might be the perfect libertarian, small l libertarian, uh, demographic. These are people who are, for the most part, very liberal when it comes to social issues. They're comfortable with people having weed. They're comfortable with different sexualities. They're, they're comfortable with all that. But maybe, just maybe, because they expect immediate immediacy in everything. You know, if, if they, they press a button on their phones and, it, and there's even the slightest delay, you see them get really upset, which makes us old people really laugh. But there's only one way to get that kind of speed, and that's through competition and the free marketplace. Is this the perfect libertarian audience. I think that there is a lot of truth to that, and uh, uh, particularly because you do have folks that are more on the socially liberal side of the spectrum when you look at a variety of issues, not necessarily abortion, but there are a variety of issues where there is more of a left-leaning bent in the sense of how you've traditionally categorized social issues. But I, I really do think that especially when you make the arguments about free markets and so forth, that there really is this opportunity to tap into the millennial generation and say, look, there are incredible opportunities opportunities here for you to better your life, and it comes through less government, not more government. Do you know how to change the oil in your car? Mm, that is a great question. That's not an answer. All right, and, and you know how to ch change a flat tire, right? I do. All right, the one. That That's I one out of do. three. All I right. can change a flat tire. There we go. That's exactly what I mean by caught between the analog and the digital generation. You guys are going to be doing this, but you're going to get a flat tire, and the whole machinery is going to break down. Yeah, I, I, I do think that the point that you make is, is a good one in this particular sense, is that we are so tech-inclined and less inclined towards things that require manual labor, both because maybe of how we were raised, but also because of the way the uh, economy is going, is that there's so much of an emphasis on these jobs that don't require your hands. And so it is, it is certainly a skill set that isn't a And here's just, just one of my many, many theories of why the left 
rich guys on the left uh, um, who give money, why are they giving money to an, to a side that destroys the system that allowed them to become wealthy in the first place? Think here in Colorado of Rupp Bridges and Jared Polis, uh, you know, um, Tim Gill, and they are giving money to something that is creating the opposite of free markets. And it really hit me one day. The difference is that they made their money in tech. And that you think about the other families uh, who have been politically involved in Colorado. And on the right, they all have brick and mortar businesses. Uh, the, the Coors family mm -hmm. had to deal with the EPA and OSHA and zoning regulations and hiring regulations and all sorts of stuff that would just drive you crazy from the very beginning up. Any small businessman who's slinging pizzas has to deal with the city and all sorts of stuff. But Jared Polis, who put together a card company online, you're dealing with people in another country doing most of the work, and it, when it pays off, it pays off. And there's not that sense of reality of how bad uh, government can stifle you. So I worry about that for kids your age, and that, that you think money comes through these apps. Somebody's still going to have to change your oil. Somebody's gonna, still going to have to put the drywall up. Someone's still going to have to deal with all those regulations. How, how do young people understand that? Well, I, I think part of it, and this, this goes to those uh, in a lot of ways who are younger than the millennial generation in particular, the next generation coming up, and, and that is by emphasizing trade schools and not simply focusing on the traditional four-year college education, because by emphasizing trade schools, you are underscoring the importance of a variety of different occupations. So, so many millennials have been raised, let's focus on these areas because of college and what a college degree can bring for you. We need to be focusing on how can we raise a new generation that really cares about these other things as well. People want to get involved, and especially young people. Where do they go? What do they do? Our website is millennialpolicycenter.org, and I think we should say millennials got two L's and two <laughs> N's in there. Because millennials don't spell because they got spell check and voice to text. Pretty much. I mean, you know, the, but, but it's worthwhile mentioning nonetheless. But millennialpolicycenter.org, it's a great opportunity to contribute, to, to share ideas, to get engaged in what we're doing. Jimmy, you do a lot of stuff. Oh, and you also do a lot of radio work, too. I Don't do. worry. Someday you'll be as ugly and old as me. Thank you much. Listen for me on KHOW Radio. Read me in the Denver Post. Tell a friend about the Independence Institute, and we'll see you next week.